thank the Marshall Institute for the invitation and the opportunity to, to share a few thoughts. I um, uh, tend to agree you know, almost with uh, everything everybody had to say here. I think that the, the uh, trick is going to be finding that, uh, that balance between affordability, resilience, and, and uh, capability. Um, I'm intrigued by the title of this, of this panel, Day Without Space. I think that, that, that term became in vogue after the, uh, the Chinese ASAT threat and, and you know, the, the sky is falling, literally. Um, and you know, we got to thinking about that. The, and there was a shift of thinking in, you know, uh, CONOPS wise about how do we operate when space isn't there. And I think that might have been a bit of an overreaction. Uh, we didn't, I haven't seen a, in the A2AD environment, there's in the open literature a lot of discussion about the threats to carriers. We, I haven't seen a day without carriers panel. Um, I also seem to recall in the Air Force we didn't stop flying airplanes because somebody invented a surface to air missile. So you, it, it's just the reality is threats evolve, you have to evolve, you have to change your thinking. So the other thing I would, I would bring up is not all space systems are created equal. Uh, some of them are very vulnerable, some are not, um, and, and, um, and the mill satcom architecture in particular is already fairly disaggregated. We have, uh, it, I don't know how many are flying now, but at one time something like 9 to 10 UFO satellites, we're going to have 5 MUOs, we've got, uh, we did have 10 discuses, about 5 or 6 of those still flying, we're going to have 10 WGSs, uh, 5 mill stars, uh, Potentially six advanced THFs and, and the partridge in a pear tree. So um, that actually makes things uh, a little worse. Uh, you know, Greg talked about the, the spaghetti architecture. Well, if you can't figure out your architecture, neither can the enemy. Uh, and finding those nodes and where they where they have to attack. Um, we also do have to concern ourselves with the reactive threats. I think I agree with what Todd and Greg had talked about the, the most the low hanging fruit for a threat is the ground stations, cyber, jamming, and and we still have to think about what we would do uh, for a co-orbital. Um, on ground stations in particular, um, they introduce vulnerabilities. I'm reminded I, if I had charts, I would show you a picture of a of a smart T terminal in Vocal Air Base in the Netherlands in 2003, when the uh, some protesters from the Plowshares movement came across the fence in a heavily guarded facility and demolished a, a nuclear command and control facility's ground station terminal with sledgehammers. Uh, so the threat can be ASATs, multi-billion dollar launchers, it can be scissors for fiber, it can be sledgehammers for ground stations, a rifle shot uh, uh, on a ground node. So the resilience question really does have to think about the entirety of the, uh, of the enterprise and the network. And as we, one thing to think about is we do hosted payloads. Uh, I'm reminded of the UFO had EHF payloads on every one of them. They were great for intra-fleet comms, but they were not connected to the rest of the network, so they always had to come through a ground station that introduces vulnerabilities if we get into that type of an A2ED environment. So those are some things we think about. Um, we've, uh, I actually come today just from yesterday's uh, launch of the advanced EHF uh, Satellite 3. Spectacular night launch, lit up the Florida sky. Uh, I'm reminded as we're now reaping the benefits of uh, you know a decade of recapitalization uh, from the 90s with the advanced DHF replacing MUOS, or replacing Millstar, with MUOS replacing UFO, and WGS replacing Discus. And I, having briefed both the WGS and advanced DHF systems to the JROC and gotten those approved and moving forward, it's, it's satisfying to see that happen. So the question is, what about the future? And, you know, the problem with predictions is they involve the future. So uh, I'm going to feel a little bit like the climate change people <coughs> taking a risk uh, about some of that. But, uh, I, I, you know, today's debate is, is all about, on the protected side, disaggregation or not. Um, as I said, there's a lot of disaggregation. And the way they've set up the debate is do you take an existing system that's part of that architecture I mentioned earlier, and divide it further between the strategic and tactical uh, systems. That's an interesting question, but I'm not sure it's the right one. In my mind, the right one would be look at the threats that Todd has, has postulated, look at the capabilities that are required, and look out to about 2030 and ask yourself, what does the nation need? 
And then you start asking your questions about what's the most affordable way to package that capability. Because disaggregation is really just a debate about packaging. And, and we have to take care as we introduce new uh, systems and if we disaggregate too far, we have multiple of our users on Advanced THF that have both strategic and tactical missions. So if you make too many changes to the terminals, do they have to go to the potential adversary ahead of time and say, this is going to be a tactical war or a strategic war because I need to know which terminal to bring to the fight. Um, and thinking through those con ops issues is, is one of the things we have to do as, a, as we think about the future in the architecture. Um, I think uh, the last thing I'd like to do is, is just a few thoughts on, um, on Todd's paper. I think the three-tier architecture has merit. Uh, at one time, we actually had that. Uh, we had, it's called hardcore core and general purpose, uh, is the, the segregation of users. And, um, and as, as he noted, it's, and, and as Greg noted, it's not very well enforced as to who went where. We pretty much got to decide that. Um, so I think that's worth looking at. Uh, evolving current systems, avoiding big risks is, is important. Uh, avoiding the cost traps is, uh, is another one that uh, has merit that uh, and the way that Todd postulated the threats was a very kinetic oriented. So if you, if you end up in a kinetic game uh, with co-orbital threats or something like that, yeah, it's a loser. But there's non-kinetic threats, there's also non-kinetic responses. Um, can't get into a lot of those details in an open forum, but uh, at some point you do have to ask yourself the full range of options. If there is an ASAT attack coming at you, there's going to be debris. The only question is, who is it? And you know, it's the old adage, would I, would I rather be the windshield or the bug? Um, so I'd rather be the windshield. So there, those are the kind of things that we have to think through in the, in the uh, follow-on architecture. So uh, the last thing I would, I would uh, comment on is, is Lockheed Martin provides also the MUO system. As we look to uh, aggregate the management of MILSATCOM, I, I think I would agree that, that, that the enterprise management of the, of the spaghetti architecture is worthwhile. We are very inefficient in how we use these systems. We're very inefficient in... And, and it also adds, it takes away from our resilience and our flexibility. And so some ability to do command and control of our C4 systems and to optimize and have the flexibility is important operationally. Whether you hand it all over to the Air Force and say you do it, as a former Air Force officer, I'm, I question that. Uh, our customer for the MEO system is the Navy, and they are an excellent customer. They manage, they know how to manage space programs. They, they already adhere to the principles that, that Mark mentioned that for a commercial-like acquisition. Uh, so I don't think we can improve on what the Navy, how they manage their systems. I can see we can make it a lot worse. Uh, but I would um, I, I suggest that perhaps a integrated management or something like that might have value. So that's all I had for today, and uh, any questions on the